And now I'd like to introduce Nancy Sinwell. She's currently our on our board as an activities chair, but in her earlier, earlier life, she was a Peace Corps volunteer. She's kept in contact with others like her and has arranged our talk today. So Nancy, over to you. Thank you. So welcome everyone. And uh, you're gonna uh, really be amazed at the people that you get to hear today. Uh, we have four members of our Friendship Force Sacramento um, group that are returned Peace Corps volunteers. Our president, Ray, served in uh, Kenya. Our vice president, Audrey, served in Togo in West Africa. Our newest member, uh, Dan Rooney, served in Thailand. And I served in Cote d'Ivoire, also known as Ivory Coast, West Africa, um, back in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Um, our three people today are going to show you how much Peace Corps is like um, Friendship Force. Not only are you making new friends, but you're actually becoming part of a community. And where we do it for one week with Friendship Force, with Peace Corps, you'll do it for two years. And you really get to know the community. You'll have plenty of friends in your town. And it will be, uh, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my whole life. I loved it so much. I stayed for a third year because I was a teacher and my students were going to have a big test and I, they needed me for one more year. So I joined, I signed up for a third year. Our three speakers today, um, Bruce Baker served in Nigeria when he was uh, younger in the 60s. And then he loved it so much that he joined again uh, in 2013 and served in Benin. Benin. Um, our second um, presenter, Fran Bowman, who lives uh, close by in Davis, um, served in Jamaica in the early 70s. And then she also served in Benin uh, in uh, 2012. And then our third speaker, Deborah DeBont, who lives here in Sacramento, did her first um, experience in Kenya in uh, 1997 to 2000. And she just recently got back from Botswana. So um, I hope you enjoy um, all the speakers and the wonderful experiences they're gonna share with you. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And we will now go to Arkansas, where our first speaker, Bruce, is joining us. Thank you very much, Nancy. Or, uh, yeah, Nancy, appreciate the introduction. And I want to start off by thanking both uh, Nancy and Chris. Nancy, for inviting me to participate in this event and giving me a chance to talk about my Peace Corps adventures, which I always enjoy doing. And Chris, for all the fine technical guidance and support he gave me, I don't think I could do this presentation if it hadn't been for his tutoring. So thank you both Nancy and Chris. As Nancy mentioned, I served in Benin, West Africa uh, from 2013 to 2015. And just to give a little geographic perspective to that, I have a map I wanna show you, actually two maps. So we'll try to get those up and this is a map of Africa. West Africa is this area right here. Nigeria is this purplish color and right next to it in the light blue color is Benin. This is a little more focused. This is Nigeria again and there's Benin and right next on the west side of Benin is Togo followed by Ghana. So that's where I spent the two years. I want to take some time to share with you what I consider to be some of the benefits and advantages of being a Peace Corps volunteer at any age, let alone being a senior. There are a couple of advantages that are somewhat unique to seniors, but most of them apply to all volunteers. You get to try a lot of new things and learn new skills and relearn some old skills as a volunteer. One of the skills I had learned as a volunteer was language. The Peace Corps is extremely good at language uh, teaching. 
And they were even able to get me up to a level where I could kind of make myself known in French uh, to some of the Beninese. Uh, people who are very gifted in language, uh, they usually master the host country lingua, lingua franca, and then the Peace Corps teaches them a local language in the area in which they'll be serving. So it's a great opportunity to learn new languages, and I appreciated that. Uh, another new skill I had to acquire was how to do a hand laundry. I know I was so shocked the first time I tried to wring out a pair of dungarees before hanging them up. I had no idea they were so hard to wring out. And I had the same discovery with bed sheets, being as they're so long and cumbersome. But eventually I figured out how to do those things. And uh, it's always a good feeling to think you can do some, learn some new things, even as a senior citizen. So that was good. And then finally, uh, I also learned how to do a bucket shower in, and in a lot of the countries where you might serve as a Peace Corps volunteer, they don't have the nice overhead shower head with hot and cold running water coming out for you. Instead, you have a, a, a large bucket full of water and a dipper, good sized dipper. And what you do is you pour some water over you, get your body wet, and then you put on the soap and lather up, scrub yourself clean, and then you use the dipper again to wash off all the water and the soap. And I know one of my co-volunteers uh, during training said to me how surprised she was that you could get just as clean in a bucket shower. So another thing to adapt to as a Peace Corps volunteer, lots of new things to learn and some old things. One of the old things I had to learn was how to ride a bicycle again. It had been 55 years since I last rode a bicycle and I had never ridden one with gears. The Peace Corps gave us a very good bike, a Trek mountain bike, with must have been a gazillion gears. I never did figure out how many gears were on that thing. They had great foresight though, and that they also issued me a helmet. And uh, that was a very good thing. They also gave a strict warning that you must wear your helmet at all times while you're riding your bike. And if you fail to do that, you will be sent home immediately. So, <laughs> That was one of their things. Now there's some other adventures that you have as a volunteer too. Uh, one of the things is you get to try out new fashions and clothing. Uh, the host families, they use the same tissue material cloth for all the outfits of members of that family. So this gentleman here is a friend of the family, but not a member of the family. And I'm of course an honorary member of the family. So I got the same pattern cloth. Another thing you get to do is to interact with new people. Uh, these are pretty much children of my host family. So those are my host siblings. And we're, I'm sharing with them some pictures I took in a, with a camera and put them on my, my laptop PC. And they were very interested in that. Now, another thing, advantage of being a Peace Corps volunteer is that you can get to acquainted with your co-volunteers. Your other volunteers are, this is all a select group of highly motivated, multi-talented people. And it really is a pleasure to get to know them and make their acquaintance. And it also has another benefit. Uh, they all have many different talents. And sometimes if you have a project going on, you'll discover that you could use some of these people because of their special talents to assist you in your project. And then it becomes a project with multiple volunteers involved, uh, which gives it a better chance of success. In my case, I was working on a project with papayas. And one of the things I wanted to try to do was create a, uh, energy based, an energy drink based on papaya puree. And in the course of doing that project, I wanted to design a label for the bottle. And the reason was that the Beninese already were bottling pineapple juice and uh, also uh, some other products and their labels were very dull. They were just uh, small labels with printed type on them explaining what the name of the product was, what the manufacturer was and other compliance issues. And I wanted to try to get across the idea 
that a label could do more than that. It could be something that says to the buyer, buy me, I'm delicious. So I mapped out some ideas for a label, but I'm no artist or graphics person, but it happened that I discovered that one of the co-volunteers in Benin with me was a young lady who was extremely gifted in computer graphics and very well trained. So I gave her my rough ideas and she converted those into beautiful uh, labels uh, that I could show my Beninese uh, people who I was working with to try to get across the idea of making a more appealing label. Now, also, you, have, you might have other seniors in your training group. This man here, his name is Richard, and he was in my training group with me, and we were both seniors. It also turns out that Richard had a background in marketing. And when I told him about these labels, Richard said, well, Bruce, why don't you let me do a focus group for those labels? And he was kind enough to do that, facilitate that uh, with Beninese people. And the feedback was very helpful in, in that project. So again, I would urge anybody uh, starting a, a career in the Peace Corps, starting a, a tour in the Peace Corps, to make a great effort to get to know your fellow volunteers. Now for many of you, that wouldn't even be an effort because you're very sociable. But if you're like me and you're a bit shy, then I would encourage you to make an effort. I did not do that in my first tour in Nigeria. And I later regretted that a bit. And so when I signed up to go to Benin, I made a great effort to get to know my co-volunteers and it turned out to be very useful. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about this papaya project. Uh, when we were in training, we trained at a kind of a model farm station called Songhai. And I discovered they sold uh, modern seeds there, primarily vegetable seeds. And these were you know, developed for tropical agriculture. And it, it also happened that they sold papaya seeds. There were two different varieties and I bought a packet of each variety. And the reason for that is I felt, okay, I might be able to give these to some Beninese people and introduce these better papaya trees to them. But also I had another co-volunteer who had sold energy drinks in Senegal before joining the Peace Corps. And I talked with him about the idea of maybe using papaya puree as a base for an energy drink to sell in, in Benin. And he thought that might be a good idea, so he gave me assistance in that idea. But I thought that these new papaya seeds might provide us with a better supply of papayas to be used uh, in our project. Here's a papaya tree. This happens to be one of the two new varieties, sorry, one of the two new varieties that I uh, introduced to uh, some Beninese people. You can see up high here, there are a lot of papayas on that tree. Problem is they're very high up, that may be 20 or 30 feet high. And these papayas weigh between four and six pounds each. They are attached to the tree by a thick stem that comes directly from the trunk of the tree. There's no, they don't hang off of branches, they just come right out of the trunk of the tree. And as you can see, they are clustered very closely together. Harvesting them, there are a couple ideas you could use. One is you could try climbing the tree. And I think for that tree, it's, it's a pretty slippery trunk. So you'd probably need those uh, climbing cleats that lumberjacks use to climb a tree. The other thing you might try to do is have a knife on, the, on a very long pole and reach up and cut off one of the papayas. And that may be doable, but it certainly is very difficult to do it without accidentally cutting one of the other papayas since they're clustered closely together. And then the final difficulty is if you do cut one, you're gonna to have to catch it after it falls 20 or 30 feet. Uh, and a five pound papaya can feel a lot heavier when it's falling that far. If you fail to catch it and it hits the ground, uh, it will bruise. Papayas bruise, bruise very easily. And once they bruise within about 24 hour in the tropics, they develop a, a mold or a fungus uh, on the bruise spot, and so their marketability decreases rapidly. 
But as I mentioned, I bought two uh, different varieties of seeds. Here's the other variety. This man is, his name is Jizun Sinzu, and he had a nonprofit organization that had a large farm, and he was a well trained, very progressive farmer. And I happened to give him some of these seeds and he planted them. Uh, the big tree that you were looking at was on his farm. There were only two of those trees that came up, but the smaller tree, he got about somewhere between 12 and 14 of these smaller trees. And you can immediately see what a tremendous economic advantage it is on harvesting. You can hold a papaya with one hand while you cut it with a knife on the other hand to detach it from the tree so it doesn't fall and bruise. And you can do it a lot faster because it's at high level. So it had tremendous economic advantage that was quickly recognized just by one glance. Uh, this, and also they have a very superior yield. As you can see, this tree here probably has somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 papayas on it. Uh, whereas the traditional papaya trees in Benin might have anywhere from four to 10 papayas on them. So you get a bigger yield and a greatly reduced harvest cost with this tree. It turned out that Jeslin planted these trees in an area of his farm that was very near a main road. And because of that, people would stop on the road and they'd see these papaya trees and they would come in to try to buy a papaya because they felt that if they got the seeds from one of these papayas, they could plant them and have a tree like that. Uh, that Jeslin had to tell them that, no, that's not possible because these are hybrid trees. But he still sold the papayas quite readily. And because it was a good economic success, Jeslin went the next step. He bought a 1,000 papaya seeds and planted them in the nursery. And here is where his knowledge and skill as a farmer really paid off. He knew how to create a seedling nursery, which these ones here are all papaya trees. Uh, this man here is a co-volunteer in my group and who was stationed at, uh, in, at Jeslin's farm. And he also has some other types of plants over here also in the nursery stage. And you see he covers them with a netting uh, for shade to keep the sun from uh, destroying, killing the trees when they're still so young. Very hard to see, but over here is a chicken or a rooster. And when I first came and visited this farm, I thought he was just raising chickens and roosters uh, for food and maybe for sale commercially. But actually that's not the case. He had all the chickens and roosters there to chase around and eat the insects that might damage his, his uh, vegetables. So that's why he was very successful at growing these seedlings. He had about a 70% germination rate. So he planted a thousand seeds that would give him 700 seedlings. He ended up planting in his own farm about 300 seedlings and he sold the other seedlings to farmers in the area. So that whole area received a whole bunch of these new high yielding papaya trees. Jeslin is still growing papaya trees on his farm now, but not nearly 300. The problem with the 300 is I think the number of papayas overwhelmed the local markets. And papayas, because they breed grooves so easily, are difficult to ship uh, any distance unless you have very good roads. And the roads there, uh, this road right, right behind him is a main road that goes to Togo over this way. And to the other direction, it goes to Cotonou, which is a large marketplace. And, and a part of that, a good uh, most of that road is paved. But even though it's paved, there are a lot of potholes. So it's very hard to take a truckload of papayas and carry them to Cotonou without badly bruising them. So as a, as a result, he's still growing papaya trees, but not nearly as many as he did at the peak there. But a sustainable project is kind of the holy grail of economic development projects. And so I was felt very fulfilled and happy that I was able to have a small part of a successful project. So now uh, that concludes my presentation. And I'd like to turn the 
meeting over to Fran Bowman, who was a Peace Corps volunteer in Benin uh, when I was there and we met each other when we were stationed there. Fran? Thanks, Bruce. Oop, I need to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So Bruce made a lot of similar points. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Benin, uh, but first I wanted to say that a lot of people um, asked me how were my two tours different. So, uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. So I started out in Jamaica in 1970, and back then most of the training for Peace Corps was in country in the U.S. And I trained as a home ec teacher, and, a, and later I became a dietitian. Um, back then, Jamaica was a really safe and healthy place to live, and we had English as the official language. So we didn't have some of those language challenges that I had later on. So fast forward to 42 years later, I ended up in Benin, and I actually moved twice in Benin also. Um, I was trained as a rural community health volunteer, and um, all of our training was in country. So we, we were flown directly from Philadelphia to Cotonou, which is the capital, and um, started right away on our training. And there was a great emphasis on health and safety in Benin because um, there are a lot of different ways to catch something from the food, the water, whatever. Um, there was also a big emphasis on language learning. So I did pretty well at French, and we also had to learn some amount of uh, our local language. In my case, it was Nago, which is a uh, unwritten language. Uh, so one of the things we learned was that Benin has a very young population. The median age right now is 17 years. Um, early pregnancy is, a really, is really common. And so there's a very high birth rate, which of course continues throughout the mother's life. Um, it leads to a high more maternal mortality and infant mortality. Malnutrition is quite common and many women and children have a low stature. So in our training, we were learning to help address some of these many barriers to good health. And I was trained as a public health nutritionist um, before this. And um, so I was interested in what were the barriers to people getting especially child vaccinations and education and child nutrition. Um, it's interesting because we're facing some of these challenges here ourselves right now. But um, one of them, Bruce pointed out, is the difficulty of travel. Uh, the time that women have to spend away from home taking their children to the clinic for the vaccination. The language um, challenge, because there are many, probably as many as 50 local languages in Benin. A lack of education. Uh, religion pays a, plays a role sometimes, and also income. Many people are not in the cash economy. So I just wanted to show you some slides that illustrate these points. This was the road from my house to another clinic that I went to once a week. And we rode on these motorcycles. Actually, I took this picture from the back of the motorcycle that I'm on toward the front. Um, and this was either usually ruddy mud or very deep dust. So it was quite dangerous to, to ride on here. Uh, the motorcycle drivers were very, very good. Um, and this is my coworker, and she's showing how she carries her baby when she rides on the motorcycle. First time I saw this, I was pretty shocked because I thought that baby would just pop right off, but they didn't. They um, were strapped on really well, and the mom then would sit on the back of the motorcycle and get to work that way. So another point that's important is education. And of course, there's no early childhood education and there's very limited education for girls. Um, but Nant has been trying to address this, but still, if you see this group of students on the right, I think there might be one girl in the group. Um, it's uh, concerning because boys have to spend time on the farm and then girls spend a lot of time at, wor at working at home. So they don't have an opportunity to get to school. Uh, religion also plays a part. So Benin is actually the birthplace of at least two different religions. One is this Christian religion, which is called Celeste. And all along the main road, you'll see these rainbow signs advertising this particular religion. It's very popular. 
And then along with that, most people also follow voodoo, which is a native language of, I mean, a native religion of Benin. This is a picture of the sacred forest. So all, if you ever see a clump of tall trees, that is a sacred forest. Those are, trees are never cut. And then on one of the paths in my neighborhood, there was this offering, voodoo offering, which changed from time to time, but basically it was a permanent offering for the religion. So I mentioned that women have to spend a lot of time at home and that's because they lack running water, electricity, or any of the modern amenities that we take for granted over here. Um, this is uh, one of my co-volunteers visiting a friend of hers. And um, you can see that she cooks over a charcoal brazier. Some people cook right over a wood fire, but you have to sit there and attend the fire all the time and attend to what you're cooking and watch your kids so they don't get into it. Um, and you have to carry water and do your laundry as Bruce mentioned uh, for bucket baths or for hand washing all of your laundry. She's enjoying the chat. Um, and just notice the house behind her is made out of packed uh, earth. So I thought this was really interesting. I made a little montage because I had seen in my village walking around that every house had a, a big uh, hole in the ground in front of the house. And I thought, oh, that must have some function. What is the function of that? Why does every house have a hole in the ground? And then I actually saw a house being built. And what they did was they dug the clay, it's very clay soil, and they carried water in a bidon like this and mixed it with the clay and some straw. And they then packed the walls into a house. And this isn't baked or it's not bricks. It's not like adobe. It's, it just dries in the sun. And obviously this person is very skilled because they're making the walls very straight and tall. And then you find some bamboo and thatch and you make the superstructure for the roof. And then you end up with a thatched roof. And this is how people who are not in the cash economy can live. Uh, they can build a house with no investment of funds. This is an illustration of how at village level, people are not relating to trade and commerce. One of the features of my tra uh, training and my service was that we were trained throughout service. And this, we had a nutrition summit, actually volunteers and staff, including uh, host country staff came from all over West Africa to attend a training on nutrition and this is our director at the time, Carrie, who visited with us. So we had volunteers from Senegal, Mali, um, Burkina Faso, Liberia, and so forth. It was quite rewarding. Um, we learned to work alongside counterparts, which Bruce mentioned also. Here we have Teresa. She's talking with a mom and about her child. And does she have any challenges in good nutrition for her child? And the woman in yellow is her counterpart who's helping to translate, no doubt, and also learning and counseling the mom along the way. So this is one way the Peace Court multiplies its impact. You never work alone. You always work with a counterpart or more than one. So I'd like to just show you where I worked. It was a health center of a town called Ajawari. And um, this is a kind of old beat up sign. It wasn't a new place. Uh, the health center was pretty large. It was in a big U shape and it had a maternity section. It had a general ward and it had uh, this gazebo where we had the vaccination clinic. And you can see the people got there on those motorcycles on an unpaved, completely unpaved road. So here's one of the wards. Um, to the rear, there were latrines and an incinerator. And then there was no running water. So UNICEF provided this hand washing station, which there's a pedal down here you can step on so that the water will come out and you can wash your hands without too much trouble. UNICEF provided a tremendous amount of uh, equipment and supplies for vaccination also. So inside this gazebo on once or twice a week, the women would gather from all over the area and wait and wait to get the vaccinations and also to get their babies weighed. Um, 
you know, growth and weight in the baby was a good sign of good health. And so uh, it was an asset that we could provide to people to give them reassurance that they were doing a good job, encouraging breastfeeding, encouraging them to come back again for the next vaccination. They had to have five, a series of five. And I noticed in my work that the vaccinations dropped off about 10% every time. So it was rather uncommon for a child to take the full five courses. Um, these are the staff. The woman in pink here is, in French is known as the sage femme, which means a wise woman. And she is the maternity nurse, pra nurse practitioner or midwife who would deliver the babies there. And she was responsible for making sure that all the pregnant women got their vaccinations before they gave birth. <clears throat> and then over here, we have a system for keeping track of who got vaccinated. And these are little cards that were marked with each vaccination and they're assorted by the neighborhood that people lived in. So the staff are just waiting to, um, to get underway with the vaccine. First, they would collect all the cards and sort them and make sure they were ready. Um, women would come from a distance, but they would also dress up quite a, lit, a lot for this event. And uh, it was a social time. They had to wait quite a long time. So um, they were re resting and relaxing and they also dressed their babies to meet. Um, Hello, uh, my name is Deborah. I'm really happy to be with you. Um, let me see if I can maneuver my screen share. Okay, uh, so I was twice in Peace Corps also. Um, the first time I was 42 when I went to Kenya in East Africa. And then I went again at the age of 61, I arrived in Botswana. So Peace Corps begins with training. Um, these days you train in the country where you will serve and it's about two months, a little over two months, and you'll be part of a, a group of Peace Corps volunteers like, uh, like my colleagues have talked about and probably the majority of them will be young um, mostly have just they've just finished their undergrad studies maybe a few have just finished grad school and then there will probably depending on the size of your group be a couple or a few older you know like retirement age volunteers and a few with ages scattered in between and you'll be assigned to live with a local family your homestay family during training and you'll spend most of your time Monday through Friday at a training center where you're going to get classes in the local language and the culture, uh, the philosophy of, philosophy of Peace Corps and development. And then as my colleagues have noted, uh, keeping yourself safe and healthy. So the Peace Corps staff, in my experience, um, work really hard and do a great job keeping the sessions interesting and fun. And they're also responsible for determining which volunteer is gonna to go to which site in the country, which as you can imagine, that's a big deal for the volunteers. And in both Kenya and Botswana, they kept this information top secret. And then they had kind of a big reveal party uh, when it was unveiled what your site would be. So, by the time the big day arrived in Kenya, um, we'd been there long enough that I really was fairly familiar with what the different regions of the country were and the different uh, ethnic groups. And I felt really convinced that no matter where they sent me, I was gonna be thrilled. Um, over in the West where it was really green or on the coast with the Swahili people or in the South with the Maasai, it was gonna be great no matter what. So, you know, the volunteers are one by one getting their assignments. Everybody is so excited. It came my turn and they said, Kitui. And they showed me where it was on the map and darn if they didn't find the exact spot on the map that wasn't any of the places that I was looking forward to serving in. And so I asked them about Kitui and they said, um, it's an arid, semi-arid area. Like, oh, 
okay, it's all dried up. I just, I, I was having a crisis. I was devastated. So this was one of the lessons that Peace Corps gifted me during my service. And it was a life lesson that I often pull out and remind myself of because honestly, there was no better site in all of Kenya. There was no better site in the world for me to go than Kitui, Kenya. In fact, it turns out there were a whole bunch of people I needed to know in Kitui. And it was, it was just, what, what unfolded was really life-changing for me. And yeah, it was, it was just an amazing experience. There was so much for me to learn and so many things for me to, you know, have my mind blown and my heart opened. Kitui had people of different ethnic groups, but primarily there were the Kamba people who were the indigenous people to the area who were known among other things as the crafts people of Kenya. And then there were also, uh, there were people, Swahili people from the coast who they had for years had trade routes from the coast into the interior. And some number of years back, they had established like an, an outpost in Kitui. So I really got to have friends in both communities. I would say that the stars were aligned in many ways for me in Peace Corps Kenya. I just, I loved Peace Corps training. I was fascinated to learn about development and about things like individualist versus collectivist cultures. Um, I already knew some Kiswahili language and getting to learn more was, was really wonderful. Um, once I got to Kitui, both the Kamba people and the, the Waswahili people, they're known for being really welcoming to visitors. And so it, I just was able to make friends really quickly. So I won't say it was always easy, there were challenges, but overall I was really, really happy there. And at the end of two years, I extended for a third year and then I extended for another half year after that. And I would say coming back to the US was really probably the hardest part. While I was in Kenya, I wasn't sure I wanted to go back. I thought of trying to get a job there, but I felt like I had changed so much during that three and a half years that I needed to go back to the US and kind of figure out who I was and then decide whether I wanted to, you know, return to Africa or stay in California. So once I got back to the US, it didn't take too long for me to figure out that I really did want to go back to Africa. But, you know, life happens and it turns out that getting back was um, challenging and it took it took a long time for me to get back. But finally, I reached a point where I was able to um, set aside my family and my, my uh, work responsibilities. And I applied again to Peace Corps. And this time I went to Botswana in Southern Africa. So you would think as significant as that experience was for me of understanding about expectations one can have without realizing it, that I would have learned that lesson in Kenya. But in fact, clearly I didn't fully learn it because I had to learn it all over again in Botswana. I had a very different experience in Botswana. I mean, initially I was delighted with my, with my Peace Corps colleagues. There were a handful of older volunteers, I think about eight of us in the group of 79 total. And, but I discovered so many amazing young people. You know, Peace Corps has done a lot, just like comparing from when I went to Kenya and when I went to Botswana, they've really made efforts to recruit volunteers that more accurately reflect the composition of the United States. So I found a much more diverse group and just getting to be friends with this wonderful, bright, 
diverse group of Americans was absolutely a wonderful treat. But once I got to my site, it also became clear that a lot of other things were different. And those differences were kind of shocking to me. Um, I think, well, this is how I explained it. Figuratively, I carried around this like giant heavy suitcase and it's what I called my Kenya baggage because you know that experience in Kenya had been so magical that it had like defined Peace Corps for me and it had defined Africa for me. And now that I was finding both Peace Corps and Africa different, I had to confront those expectations one by one and wrestle them down. And to be honest, the stars didn't align quite the same way in Botswana as they had in Kenya. Um, Peace Corps had trouble finding me a house. And when they did, it was this amazing, modern, new two bedroom house, but it was really empty. And the local people, my neighbors, my colleagues at work, they were just reserved in a way that I hadn't found Kenyans to be. And initially for quite a while, I felt like I really struggled to unlock the puzzle of how to make friends. And the language, Setswana, it was structured similarly to Kiswahili, but it was way more difficult. And when I was in my 50s, I had some hearing loss. So that added to the challenges of learning the language, as did, you know, my memory wasn't what it had been when I was younger. And in retrospect, I think when I arrived, I was really exhausted from a number of years of heavy family responsibilities and work responsibilities. And uh, I think it just took a while for me to kind of recoup my energy. But it was also a different time in the world. When I was in Kenya, there, was, there were no smartphones, uh, no social media. And now in Botswana, these things were like everywhere and being heavily used, especially by the young people. So Peace Corps issued us smartphones, that little smartphone you see in the picture. And then I went and bought, I'm sorry, the little phone, the not smartphone. And then I went and bought the smartphone after I got there. So I could keep up with Botswana friends as well as uh, US and, and Kenya friends. Plus, additionally, um, right after I arrived, Trump was elected. So my own country was going through this huge transformation and I was really struggling, kind of head reeling, trying to understand it from so far away. And for that reason, and also because I left my very frail mom in Washington state when I went to Botswana, I felt like I was kind of um, one foot in Botswana, one foot in the US, sort of tethered by social media. But gradually this changed. I one by one wrestled those Kenya expectations down and I began to become aware of the gifts that Botswana was offering. And it was offering many wonderful gifts. Um, integrating into the community, it happened at a very different pace, but eventually the doors began to open and some really amazing friendships grew. And my work was also slow. Um, I was assigned to an organization that was unfortunately really falling apart by the time I got there. And so Peace Corps moved me to another organization. And unfortunately, it didn't really have work for me in the end. So I was kind of on my own to figure out work, which um, really was fine. I ended up falling back on what I had done in Kenya, which was working with entrepreneurs, um, helping them with, with um, building their business skills. And once I found that work, it was just wonderful. I loved it. I loved my students and they became my friends. And then in turn, um, I was able to become friends with others in the community. And uh, pretty soon I was being invited to community gatherings and events. And by the time I had to leave, there were so many people to say goodbye to and so much I had to grieve as I um, went away. So every Peace Corps experience is so unique. You know, it's set in a different time, a different place, a different phase of the volunteer's life. 
and linked to the particular people that they meet and the relationships that unfold. You really can't anticipate what it'll be like. I remember trying to imagine what my life in Kenya would be like when I was getting ready to leave. And I went through that exact same thing when I was getting ready to leave Botswana. And it was like trying to look into a fog bank. I couldn't see anything. But, you know, I thought I had no expectations, but those expectations turned out to be there. You know, I, I guess it's human to have expectations. We build these expectations based on the experiences that we've had. But as, as many of you know, when you go to live in a completely different culture, there are a whole lot of things that turn out to be outside of those expectations. And I know many of you also know that living in a new culture is very humbling. You know, all that you have known can suddenly seem really irrelevant. Um, I remember both in Kenya and Botswana, there were times when I felt like a kindergartner, like I didn't know how to do the most basic things like communicate, like in Botswana, clean the yard, or in Kenya, fix the most basic dishes. Going through that process of learning to get past that kindergarten stage, it can be really challenging, but it's also amazing. And for me, those glimpses I get at my own culture and my own expectations are like both appropriately humbling and sort of amazingly mind expanding. And then, as you guys certainly know, there's the issue of friends. So in Peace Corps, you take this giant leap of faith, right? You live behind all the people you know, and you go into com a community where you don't know anyone. And there you face communication barriers, you face barriers to, you know, you, you have misunderstandings and, and you don't understand cultural norms. And yet somehow friendships still manage to emerge. I mean, you guys, your whole organization is about growing friendships cross-culturally. So as I know, I don't need to tell you, those relationships really are the most important thing. And for me personally, watching those friendships emerge in spite of the differences, it's like, oh my God, that feeds my soul. And it really gives me this great faith in humanity. So whatever you might expect a Peace Corps experience would be, should you decide to do one of your own, it will be different in ways you can't possibly imagine. But that said, um, there are a few generalities that I think I can share. Um, over the years, since Kenya, people have asked me, you know, I'm thinking about Peace Corps, is it a good idea? And so I, I kind of put together a little pros and cons list. Um, I'll share this with you quickly. Uh, the cons, I'll start with those, uh, the challenges. The process of applying is, uh, is tedious. And for us older volunteers, um, getting medically accepted um, can be sometimes nerve wracking, um, a bit challenging, definitely time consuming for many of us. Um, Putting your life on hold is no small feat, especially if you are no longer a 21 year old that is just finishing undergrad uh, and then putting it back together again when you get home, it also takes a significant amount of energy. So this third bullet, Peace Corps takes safety and security and the health of its volunteers incredibly seriously. So if a situation occurs in a country such that Peace Corps is worried that it can no longer assure the safety and security of the volunteers, it will evacuate the volunteers. Or if a volunteer develops a medical condition that it feels it can no longer safely treat in the country, then it will evacuate that volunteer, um, sometimes ending their service pretty suddenly. And often these evacuations make total sense and everyone is grateful to be taken care of. But there are also times when volunteers may assess things differently and disagree and you know, not really have that choice. And because these evacuations often happen very suddenly, 
it can be kind of traumatic because, um, you know, if you've been building relationships at your site, you may not even have time to say goodbye to anyone or at least to everyone. And, and um, in some cases, you don't even have time to pack up your stuff. So um, the moving on the initial training at times can be exhausting. I didn't experience this in Kenya and Botswana. They were trying to pour so much into a training that I felt like it got a little bit um, exhausting at times. Um, as I said in in my experience in Botswana, the experience it can be kind of isolating, especially in the beginning. If you're rule adverse, there are certain rules you need to follow. And it's a two year commitment, which can seem like a long time. But on the positive side, you get a chance to live in a community in another country, which in my mind is amazing. And Peace Corps does so many things that make this possible and that make your transition into that new community way easier than it would be in other kinds of situations. And I would say that the great, um, the great amount of, of investment it has in training you in the language and culture is a huge part of that. And then the attention it pays to your safety and security and your medical care that also is, um, is, I think, a huge, huge positive. And your everyday financial needs, if you want to do an extravagant vacation, you'll need to come out of pocket on your own probably. But as long as you're willing to live uh, fairly modestly, your everyday financial needs will be taken care of. And then as, my, as, as both uh, Bruce and Fran have mentioned, that cohort is huge. And you get to be um, a part of this group that gives you an opportunity to kind of escape into an American world during those times when you need that. And uh, one perk that I love is that you can go around and visit different volunteers in different parts of the country at their sites and get these amazing insights into other parts of the country. And for me, that two years, oops, for me, that two years is really the right amount of time. It takes time. And I think a lot of volunteers feel that two years is a long time. They may even feel that well into their first year. But by their second year, time starts flying by. And, you know, it just takes time to get acclimated and to make friends and to be effective in your, in your job and in your role as a Peace Corps volunteer. And now finally, afterwards, you get to be an RPCV. So uh, I know that, um, that there's at least four of you in the, in the group that can attest to that. And, and um, it's a wonderful group of folks. This picture was taken less than a month ago. Um, this is a group that does a camp out up in the Sierras every year. So this is all returned Peace Corps volunteers and their, um, and their loved ones. So that was, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my stories with you. If you wanna to talk to me more about it, I'm really happy to be in touch. And I did a blog when I was in Botswana. This is the, the URL. You're welcome to take a peek if you're interested. So thank you so much. All right, Deborah, thank you. Um, if I could have um, our other speakers turn their videos back on and we'll try and get them back uh, up. I've got a lot of people to go through here to make sure I get the right people on, but we're gonna add uh, some more here. Let's get, uh, see if I can find Fran, there's John. We're gonna um, bring John Keller in too. He's, oops, I put the wrong button. Let me go back. I wanted to actually add John. And um, John is a recruiter for the Peace Corps. So he'll be helping us with some of our questions. And uh, Fran had a little audio problem earlier. Um, we're hoping that's gotten fixed. Let me see if I can find her in our list here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Fran. I just need to find you. Are, is your video oh, uh, That's uh, That's actually uh, a lesson now. That's just to be... Flexible and patient. Fran, Fran is, your, is your video on? My video is on. I'm not finding it. Hold on, let me see. This. Oh, there, I found you. Never mind. Got you now. Okay. All right. So here are 
our panelists, shall we say, and um, I'm going to just go through some of the things that are in the chat for now, and um, you all can answer them as you see fit, and then we'll open it up to questions where people can unmute themselves. Um, so let me just start at the top. Uh, someone said, I think Emily mentioned there's another Peace Corps program for seniors less than a year. Can you, I guess, John, that would be to you. Yeah, um, so there is, it's called a Peace Corps response. And so it's not necessarily um, to focus towards seniors, it's actually just focused towards more people with more experience. So seniors mostly have that experience, um, but it's much more focused. It's much more kind of policy level where you're going in, you're working with like the Philippines education department in, in creating um, you know policy for the elementary school classrooms throughout the entire country. Um, they're, they're much more focused I, and there's much less training. Um, so really you're going in, you have a specific job and you need to have specific skills to do that specific job. So that's what Peace Corps response is. Um, and, and that's different from the 27 month program that is our much more popular kind of program um, as well. Okay, and that was, I think you said in the chat, six months to a year? Yeah, six months to a year. Great. Um, Larry asked a question about the, um, Trees, how many months of, or years between planting the seed and getting a tree with fruit? Bruce? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the advantages of those hybrid trees is, is, it, is it is a short time. For the dwarf or semi dwarf red, uh, royal papayas, they say uh, nine months. But in my experience with Gisland's farm, it was a year uh, before they were really producing fruit. Mm. But still, that's pretty good. If it's. <laughs> It's really if it's a longer time than that, it's pretty hard to do as a Peace Corps volunteer unless you're planning on extending for a couple more years. <laughs> Can you get, get, give us some idea about the seeds? Um, are they expensive? Can the, do the farmers able to get them again? Um, GMO, anything about? Um... Yeah, I saw those questions. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that, those are great questions also. These seeds were non-GMO. Uh, they were, there's a plant breeding program in the Philippines at the University of the Philippines Los Banos campus. And that's where these papayas were developed. And they had in the works, uh, when I was reading about it, a, a papaya that tasted like a mango. I don't know if they ever brought that to market or not, but that would really be cool. <laughs> uh, but they were non-GMO and uh, they were actually, the seeds were produced in Thailand producing uh, hybrid seeds is a, an art in itself. Mm. And then they were sold through, throughout the world by East West Seed Company. And be, because of my activity there in Atiyame with Jisun's farm, uh, the project got a little more publicity than, than was probably good for it. Uh, several of the Peace Corps staff people came through there and, and the Peace Corps country director uh, was appreciative of the project because I had thanked him for encouraging me in that project at one point. So what happened is the Peace Corps offered to give seeds to any volunteer who wanted them. So there was a run on seeds. And uh, the problem, as I've kind of mentioned in my presentation, it's, it's a little tricky to grow those seedlings because of the darn mice and the ants and all the other little rodents that want to eat those seeds up. And uh, Jesus knew how to deal with that. But the other people that I gave those seeds to didn't understand that. And they, they were not successful in raising uh, those trees. And I suspect that also these trees, in order to produce well, they need to be irrigated, particularly as you go further north and begin, been in where there's less water anyway. <clears throat> uh, and without the irrigation, you're, you're not going to get those superior yields that you saw in those trees. So oh, those are those are some problems, and because of the uh, run on the on the seeds, the price of the seeds went up quite a bit, and I, I found that kind of sad. Uh, but that, that's the way it happened, and uh, so what can you okay. do? Just have to we'll switch gears a little bit um, and go to Fran. Um, do you do you know how the Christian religion started? Was it due to missionaries? Is the question. I I don't know about Celeste specifically, but I don't believe it was a result of missionaries. Um, there are many Christian religions in Benin, many denominations that we know about, like Methodist and Baptist and so forth, Catholic, because it was a French colony. Um, 
But I believe Celeste is pretty homegrown and they have a unique dress that they wear, a style of dress that no one else wears, which is seems rather impractical, but it's um, bright white satin. So um, they're the only people that wear that bright white satin. So I really don't think that came from another denomination. Um, and they have an annual convention that in Cotonou that I think is just for Celeste. So I believe it's, um, it's a modern religion in the sense that they use French and they use local language. Um, Voodoo, of course, is an ancient religion. Um, and did any of you have any problems with the people not wanting you to be there, sort of distrust of the Peace Corps in general? And then uh, on that sort of same subject, um, distrust of the vaccinations and any issues regarding trust from the people that you lived with or worked with? Well, um, yes, uh, there was also a, a strong Muslim population in Benin. And um, I'm not sure if that affected, I know in some parts of the country it affected the vaccination program because um, um, I can relate to the fact that in Nigeria, we've actually heard since then that vaccination teams were being attacked in the northern part of Nigeria, which is similar to the northern part of Benin. Um, but I couldn't generalize because everyone in Benin, Muslim and Christian, they all just live together without any trouble. So uh, I think they all came and went to the vaccination clinic. But I understood that the family structure, the woman wasn't always deciding for the child. Um, so the father was often deciding what would happen for the child. And that might have been an impact on certain religion. Certain religions would restrict, it would make the um, father more powerful in the family. Deborah, did you have any comments on that? No, no I, I felt welcomed in as far as I could see, Peace Corps was welcomed in both Kenya and Botswana. Great. I just wanted to um, read Emily's comment. Bruce, Bruce, I was gonna make a comment. Oh, Bruce, were you going to say? Yeah, I'd like to add a little something there, Chris. I, I felt like in uh, Benin, uh, there was a fair amount of xenophobia. And there are a lot of smaller tribal groups there. And then the foam tribe was a, was a more dominant tribe. And in the ancient, in the 200 year history of, uh, of Benin, it was a big slave trading place where the uh, warriors of one tribe would go and attack another tribe and take prisoners and then bring them to the coast and sell them for slaves. So I, th I think that contributed to a, a fear of strangers. Mm -hmm. And it's like all these other uh, hostilities, uh, once you get to know people and they know you on a personal basis, why those generalizations disappear. But uh, in Benin, the, the kids, when you would ride around, would say, Yobo, Yobo. And what that Yobo meant was stranger, stranger. And it was part of their tradition to be alert to any strangers. And uh, I know even some of the uh, African-American volunteers in our group, they encountered the same thing. People selling, yelling, Yobo, Yobo. So it wasn't directed just at white people, but anybody who was a stranger, I suppose that if you were in a foam area, foam tribe area, and somebody from another tribe came to you, they'd probably get the same treatment. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Well, there's some questions I'm gonna sort of pull together and I think they're, they're related for John and it's, um, are there an age limit for volunteers? Um, what? Uh, let's start with that. No, Here's, well, I'll try and be as as concise as possible. Nope, you can be as old as you want. Um, Peace Corps will uh, support you in in every way that they can. So George has a cute question. What opportunities are there for really old doctors? Yeah, I mean, to that, I'd say you, we have a health volunteer position. Um, so you won't, I can tell you this, in the Peace Corps, in the health department, you're not like sticking any needles or you're not like, you know, actually doing doctor work. You're doing community health work where you're promoting vaccines, where you're promoting HIV AIDS education and prevention. So that's what I'd say um, would be the best. I mean, you could also be a teacher too. You probably qualify for that. But um, community health is um, also an old doctor. You could do Peace Corps response and kind of do some upper level um, policy help with um, um, health organizations and NGOs in, in those countries. That sounds good with a shorter time period. Um, 
there's two people asked about um, what skills are sought or or needed in the Peace Corps. Yeah, so skills, I mean, any. so we have six different sectors. We have community economic development, which you heard about. We have education, we have health, we have youth and developments, we have agriculture, and we have education. I think it's the six ones. Um, environmental, I think I said education twice, environmental. There we go, that's the six different sectors. So if you have any skills specific to those six sectors, that helps a lot. Um, if you have, the normal requirements is five years of professional experience or college degree. So you don't need a college degree. Um, if you just have five years of professional experience, that also qualifies you. So I think most people here have that, have one of those two. Um, so any skills related to those six sectors or our generalist position is education. So if you have experience, you know, as a, you know, data engineer, I don't know, I'm making it you would still probably qualify as a as a teacher. So that's our, our generalist um, our generalist kind of sector, along with community economic development. A lot of times people qualify for one of those two if they don't have any specific like no um, health skills or something like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, do the volunteers receive any salary while they're serving? Yes, so the, the what I liken it to is you will be compensated what a local teacher makes. No matter your sector, no matter your, um, position, whatever it is, you'll probably be compensated relatively similar to what a local teacher makes. And that varies based on the country. So in Ethiopia, I made about $130 per month because that's what a local teacher makes. And I know everyone else here would, I, I think most people kind of say, yeah, about that um, is, is what you'll make. So yes, you're compensated. Also outside of your salary, your healthcare is completely covered by the Peace Corps. Everything is completely covered by the Peace Corps and your rent is covered by the Peace Corps as well. Um, so that's outside of your, your salary. So that's how you're compensated um, by, by the Peace Corps. Okay. I could just add on to that, Chris. Uh, as a, as a retired person, when I joined the, the Peace Corps the second time, uh, I was drawing my social security. And when I was living in the US, obviously you have to use that for your living expenses. But when, you, when I joined the Peace Corps, as John was just saying, all the in-country expenses are paid for, your health, uh, your health coverage is complete. So uh, depending on how many residual expenses you left behind in the in the U.S. monthly expenses, uh, a good bit of your Social Security uh, payments can be just put into savings, which is a, an advantage that uh, is particular to retired seniors. And there is a readjustment allowance, John, you might want to mention. Yeah, also, when you get back to America, they give you a little over $10,000. So so that, yeah, uh, fans, right, fans right on that. That's a pretty... Um, so you're paid, you're compensated while in country as about a local teacher. Then when you go back to America, they give you a readjustment allowance. Basically, the idea is that if you're coming back from America or coming back, yeah, if you're coming back to America, you need to, a lot of people don't have their life set up. As they mentioned, um, a lot of, some people have like just come from college um, and they're returning for the first time after that. So they give you $10,000. They give everybody a little over $10,000 for um, to do whatever you want with it. It's kind of a blank check that's, you know, deposited right into your bank account. Now, is Peace Corps only for Americans? Yes. Um, yes, that is basically because it is a branch of the federal government. It is only for Americans. And like, I'm, personally, I think that's um, kind of like frustrating because like, even if you're, you have to be a U.S. citizen um, to be in the Peace Corps. So that's gotcha. short answer. Can I add to that, though, that several of the countries have the equivalent of a Peace Corps uh, organization. I know uh, Great Britain has a GBSO program. And I don't know about Canada. I suspect they may have a program similar. Mm, good point. You, you know, John, whether those uh, whether Canada has a, a, a volunteer service program? I don't. Um, I know that South Korea and Japan both have pretty strong, um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't. Japan's going to France, France and Germany. Hmm. Um, who gives the health care to the Peace Corps volunteers in the, in the country when they're there? Yeah, so that's good. Peace Corps has on-call doctors that are employed by Peace Corps uh, in that country. So they try, they have their doctors, our doctors normally have a Western standard of medicine, but they are most of the time, sometimes they come from other countries, but they're um, people, doctors from that country, but they are Peace Corps doctors and they are going to be on call 24 seven. So a lot of times if you get sick, it's not at, you know, 3 p.m. on a Tuesday. So I got kidney stones in Peace Corps. So I got kidney stones at midnight on a Tuesday and, you know, called, called the doctor and 
told them what's up and, you know, all got taken care of. Well, having had them myself, I know how painful that can be. Um, uh, there's a question about, can you contact Peace Corps Medical in DC to see if a current medical condition is disqualifying before applying to join the Peace Corps? Yes, you can. I just posted that link in the chat there. It's pre-service unit at peacecorps.gov. Oh, great. And speaking of posting things, Deborah, you might be able to post your blog. Uh, can you write that in the chat? That might be a place that people can look for that and copy it. Um, Chris, yeah. could I make a comment? Uh, yeah, hold on one second. I just want to double check that we've got everybody's questions in the chat before we go, and I think we do. So yeah, we're going to open it up to anybody who wants to unmute yourself. I prefer it if you raise your hand, but go ahead, whoever that was who just asked that question. Yeah, that was me. Uh, my name's Kerry Johnson. I was, uh, I've been sworn in to, as a Peace Corps volunteer nine times. So I was first in the 60s, always in French speaking West Africa. So I've been to Guinea three times actually. And I've been to uh, Niger three times. So I know a lot about Niger. Anyway, to get back. So of those seven, of those nine times, seven of them were as a response volunteer. So that means that I've spent a lot of recent time as a response volunteer in French-speaking West Africa. And a couple of comments. You had somebody who was uh, in a, with a medical background. That is very desirable among the response volunteers. I would encourage anybody that's thinking of being a Peace Corps volunteer, if they have the experience in the medical field, to get in touch and, and, and look it up. You can look up online what's available today. And uh, in fact, uh, many of the Peace Corps countries have cut back on what they're advertising online and, and only posting positions that are in a medical arena. So that's very desirable right now in the Peace Corps. Um, I strongly recommend people, older people, to consider going into the response volunteer positions. They're a lot shorter. Um, most of mine were around nine to 12 months, kind of depending on what the job was. Other things that are, I think, good for older people is you know exactly what your job is before you go. You know exactly where you're going to be working before you go. And uh, I've been through the long training back in the 60s when it was held in the States, but I really like the training in response. I mean, I've had response trainings of two weeks down to one day, kind of depending. I mean, the one day obviously was my third time back to, to uh, Benin. So they all knew me. I just walked in, they said, hi. They said, so, okay, we need you to swear in and you're out in the field. So any questions about response, I might be able to help out. Excellent. Um, I'd like Emily Hopkins to unmute herself if she's still on. Uh, Emily, you still there? Because you had a comment about Kitui, and I think it'd be nice if it came from you directly. Hi. Yeah, I just want to say uh, a few years ago, uh, Friendship Force had a, oh, what do you call the combined humanitarian journey to Kitui, Kenya. And so there is a club, a Friendship Force club in Kitui, Kenya, and I have friends there. And it was a wonderful experience. I love the people of Kenya. And um, I just enjoyed this program today and it made me think of my friends there. Cool, thank you. So Dan and Angie had uh, their hand up. You can unmute yourself and, and, yourself and you can turn on your video if you'd like. Okay. 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 <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay, yeah, two questions. Um, and this would be about Peace Corps response. First of all, uh, can you request to go to a certain area? For example, I'm, I'm one of the people that was in the uh, Peace Corps earlier in Thailand, and uh, I'd be interested in going back to that part of the world, basically because I still have a basic proficiency in the language and in the culture. And two, is there a way of 
finding out what kind of response programs are available in the, you know, in certain parts of the world or, or everywhere. Well, sounds like to you, John. Like yeah, I can answer you, that John. really quickly yeah, or very easily. Or so very easy. the link I posted, I'll post it here again, list every position in Peace Corps response. So if you go to the chat and click on that, you can be as specific as you want by country. You can see the exact positions. As Carrie kind of alluded to, they're much more specific about what you will be doing. Um, and so I would click on that link and it, they're much more detailed about the skills needed and about what you'll be doing. So, so that, that's all that information um, about where you, can, where you go, what you'll be doing. Uh, let me just follow up with a little Zoom thing too. For those of you who don't know, when you click on the chat, uh, button at the bottom and it brings up the dialog box. If you go to the three little buttons, the more buttons to the right, um, there's a thing that says save chat. If you click on that, once you leave this um, program at the end, it will download uh, that information to your computer so you can look it up so you don't have to worry about copying or worrying what's uh, some of these things people have written in the chat. You can also take a screenshot if you know how to do that. But for those of you who don't, um, the more buttons in the chat box will allow you to save the chat. Okay, anybody else have a question or they wanna raise their hand or say, oh yeah, Pat, I see your physical hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Did you call on me? Yes. Okay, uh, my qu question is what, what are some of the, you mentioned the response volunteer positions. What kind of positions are those? I can give you maybe like a, a quick like example of them. Like for example, in Jamaica, agricultural business development specialist. In Guyana, a school support officer for the PTA. Um, for uh, community economic development, organizational capacity building specialist for an HIV AIDS NGO in Ukraine. Um, in Ukraine, a special education teacher or advisor. So they're much more specific. Whereas if the normal 27 month program, it's education, and you'll have like opportunities to do different projects. Um, so these are much more specific, much shorter. Yeah, I could tell you the exact ones that I worked at, some of them, and they were different. Uh, university professor, um, expert on computer networks and running an IT department in a large university. Um, I was a consultant at a university, bringing professors together to work as teams to make changes in curriculum. So another one was uh, entrepreneurship, developing entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship teaching materials for secondary and elementary grades in French because they didn't have it in French. So it needed to all be translated and rewritten so that it would work in the schools in Senegal. So that's a couple of examples. I mean, they're very specific, you know, exactly where you're going, et cetera. Great. Carrie, some people, uh, someone asked if you could share your contact information. If you feel comfortable, you can um, reply to that individual or put it in the chat to everyone. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate your help. Anyone else have a question? Okay, not not seeing anything. Let me try and scroll through all these. We still have 36 people on. No, looks like we're done. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy right now and make uh, her spotlight. So Nancy. Okay, well, I want to thank all of our speakers. We can give them a round of applause. <laughs> And, um, and everybody for attending as well. Um, we do have a large group of returned Peace Corps volunteers here in the Sacramento area and in the uh, neighboring towns like Nevada City and Grass Valley and all. I think there are almost a thousand returned volunteers in this area. And um, our Sacramento Valley Return Peace Corps volunteer group donates to projects that California volunteers are doing. They send us a project and say what kind of uh, money they need. And then four times a year, our group sends them money. And one of the ways that we get the money is we have an international calendar 
that we sell. And um, the 2022 calendar is available. And it has, uh, it's all about children in foreign countries. The countries this year for 2022 are Niger, Afghanistan, Thailand, Uganda, Lesotho, Kenya, Ecuador, Haiti, India, Mongolia, Pakistan, and Armenia. And I, I'll try to hold this up, but I was having trouble getting it to show up very well. But you can see some of the children that are shown. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. So, um, and uh, we sell them for $14 each. Or um, if you buy 10 or more because you're giving them as gifts, they're $12 each. And you can just um, contact me if you want one. Um, and we'll work out a way to get together. So if you would go ahead and put your contact information in the chat, that would be helpful. Email, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I, I'm not good at doing chat, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll try and remember. I, I don't know if I can get it. Maybe uh, you could put it in for me. Yeah. Just my email, yeah. Um, well, thank you. This is really, uh, I, I really enjoyed that myself being a Peace Corps volunteer from the late 60s, uh, brought back a lot of good memories. And I don't know if I can volunteer right now, but I'd sure like to go back to where I taught. <laughs> <laughs>